Hello and welcome to Average Traders. Today we're going to be discussing crashing commodities, what the drop in the 10 year means for the market. Will inflation continue? Have we hit the lows? But before that, joining us is a very, very special guest, a superstar in some circles. Some say he's the new Warren Buffett. Others say he's the reason that Bitcoin <laughs> dropped 50%. Welcome, wow. Mitt. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me. Pleasure wow. to be here. Uh, it's good to have you, Mitt. Uh, you know, I want to say a couple of words about him. Like, um, I've known Mitt since he was born. Um, uh, but the thing <laughs> is, we, but on a trading front, we've actually been trading together for a good 15, 20 years. In fact, when I used to be um, a prop trader trading Boon Bob on chat, um, he often came into our offices um, over by Liverpool Street in London. And we were actually um, sitting on the opposite end of the Flash Crash legend, which is Nav Sorrell. So we saw him trading like, a hundred thousand lots in the e-minis and so uh, we you know we, we took a lot of inspiration from him and so we he's a he's a pure technical guy i don't think he um cares at all about fundamentals but he's um he's been around the block he knows how to trade and we're glad to have him on the show thanks for having so me for the introduction that's super yeah. nice <laughs> was it pre-written <laughs> how have you been finding these See, last yeah. you know like we yeah. like like we discussed before it's just as a technical trader, I don't care if it goes up or down. There's money to be made both ways. So um, fundamentally, it's good to know the fundamentals from a high perspective, just to which way the market is going or trending. Um, but you can see that all in the technicals. It's more um, big decisions and news that I look out for on a daily. And I normally do intraday trading. So again, um, overnight, what happens overnight over the weekend does not concern me at all. Yeah, I mean, how you, how's your trading been? You've been finding much success? Yeah, um, yeah since COVID, markets have been moving at a, um, better way it's more trendy the less consolidation just more opportunities both ways up and down so i'm um, being taken advantage of it and looks like everyone else has yeah apart from me <laughs> <laughs> yeah no, i mean but today we've had a pretty wild day as it is every time we do a pod yeah. um we've been off for about a week and a half like i went away for a bit um uh, there was a July 4th uh, weekend over here, so it, it sort of quieted down quite a lot of the, as, you know, the activity sort of died down. But today we saw huge moving commodities. We said oil, WTI and Brent down around 10%. I haven't seen a move that big. And still trying to find a specific reason. I could not find a specific reason for it. We've had these murmurings that there's a new variant of Omicron over in China, which might have like put a bit of a, a tailwind into some of these, I mean, headwind into um, oil, but the commodities in general just came off a cliff. We have wheat down, um, soybeans, corn, um, aluminium, just across the board. Gold was down, silver, silver was back in, you know, back in 19, no, gold was in the 1700s again. So we've seen some big moves lower. And I mean, the real question is how is this going to really impact next month's inflation reading? And I think what Jason just said about the 10 year and the yields in general across the board going up the way they are. I mean, I think you can sort of pre, you can see that with this commodity drop, we're going to get a you know, decent drop in inflation. You would have thought now the real question is how much of this built is through to the real economy with all of these prices. Cause I mean, all of these companies have raised prices so much. Um, you know, we've seen um, wages go up uh, just, commodities, uh, I mean, just general end user good prices go up, rents go up. Now, the thing is that with all these import costs going down at the rate they are now, are these companies going to just now profit for it or are they going to pass on the costs? I mean, what do you say, Jason? What do you think? We're seeing actually, well, here in the UK anyway, quite a few um, battles for the consumer to keep prices down. We see Tesco's and uh, their battle with Heinz actually keeping very popular Heinz products off the shelves. Uh, just to kind of stop them increasing prices unfairly to customers. And what you can see with Tesco is obviously they have their own brand products. They can see what things are actually costing. So, and they have a wealth of pricing data. So they know that when these large companies are actually increasing prices more than they should, uh, you know, they're taking a stand for the customer. But we're seeing also uh, large increases in um, chip supply, especially in South Korea, uh, we'll, we'll get a little chart up seeing the, 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 the excess inventory there. And uh, that's going to kind of bode well for graphic card and CPU production. Uh, so we're starting to see more and more production come online for uh, manufacturers to put into their products. And now with this, we're going to now see if we can actually get deflation in prices or do we have a new baseline going forward? Obviously, with some products, we're going to see that's the higher cost because uh, wage inflation has been built in uh, to this. But when it comes to products where, uh, you know, efficiencies are so strong, you know, and a lot of production has come online all around the world, we're going to actually be able to see that glut of supply push prices down. And hopefully that'll be a good thing for the CPI prints coming forward. And uh, it will help the Fed ease their increases in, in rates. Um, but will it come quick enough? 
that's the question. Rajan, what do you reckon? Well, I mean, I mean, that's what I think the market's already pricing in. You've seen the 10 year down 50, 60 basis points from the high in, in such a quick fashion. And the thing is, I think the market is seeing these falling commodity prices and it pretty much is a precursor for the next inflation print. So you can see that the market's already sort of pricing in that the Fed is going to slow down. In fact, uh, the curve is actually inverted. Um, and there's, you know, they actually think that the Fed's going to cut rates. Uh, next year, rather than, you know, uh, once the hiking cycle uh, finishes, uh, when they get to what they perceive as neutrality. So the thing is that next year, they're actually pricing in that the Fed is going to cut it. And so I think it's still playing in. But the real question is, with all these commodities, we're seeing everything come down right now. But is it going to last? Is this just, you know, is this just like a, a dip and then it's going to race back higher or not? I don't know. But uh, I mean, what do you say? What do you see on the technical fronts in, in the 10 year, the commodities? Or what, what do you see? So this is a 10 year bond. It's from the high from 2018, October, November area. And as you said, um, it did drop down, a nice spike down. Didn't want to close above the high, the previous high. Um, I, I would say it's still in a uptrend, as you can see, until it kind of breaks this swing low. Um, I was thinking it, it remains in uptrend. It can either bounce from here or it can come down and then we'll actually see the difference um, in the 10 year bond. So basically these are where all the blocks where um, a lot of buying comes in. And so this level right here has had a lot of support. It's hit twice and we're at the high of the market. So this is where um, key areas where they either consolidate or they um, repel away from. So right now we're in, a, we're in that area, if we go back to the weekly, we're in the area where it's a um, high volume area because of being at an edge at the highs and the lows. So this is where the most reactions happen, where most enters, most traders enter or exit their trade. Um, as you can... I see, I see that, that double top, exactly. it was like a, it was like it a pin a bit, bar, yeah. you know, exactly. it, yeah, it was, a, it was a pin bar there. So basically it did, it just got totally rejected. I, th at I think about all the people then... that are um, shorting their way down and had their stops above there, this spike had taken them out. Yeah. And so they're, they're going to re-enter yeah. the market and wait for the reaction. At these two it, it definitely seems like the market was hunting them. Oh, hunting by that, that yeah. pin bar. And it closed um, yeah. underneath it, like it didn't close above the high. So um, that's a strong rejection bar. And then three consecutive bars down again. Um, there's a micro double bottom here, if you can see. Um, again, the, the, this is basically the way I'll trade this is I don't care about the fundamentals. I'll see that it's at the high and um, I can see it's ranging from top to bottom. So when it gets to the, the lower area, I'll look for some kind of um, consolidation and a bullish bar showing that, like, can, can you see over here? We get to the low that was already here and there's three pin bars, uh, three dojis, and then a, a bullish bar that shows that buyers entered the market. And so that's where you start looking for your potential lungs up into the top of the range. And then um, that's how I would usually trade these kind of things. So from a technical perspective, um, we're in a range. And then which way will break out will show which way the 10 year is going. Yeah, I mean, I mean, looking at that, it definitely it was, we've seen three strong red bars to the downside. Exactly. So it's whether it um, consolidates, you know, whether it starts petering down as we get to that lower support and whether it sort of sticks there well, or is it going exactly. to pierce straight through to that next level, which is, um, which so, is just below yeah, so that. Yeah, so someone like it could come back up, test the high again and maybe break and continue up or um, it could even just break down, test it again to see if it does want to go up and maybe continue down. So um, it really depends on what, what the market's doing and what, again, this, this for this one, fundamentals would play a part and um, but as you can see the charts, it shows exactly what the fundamentals are saying and where we are in the economy. And, you know, just looking at that, you can see today if we had like a big rally in a lot of these growth names because with the, you know, with uh, with these lower rates and talk of the Fed maybe slowing down with these uh, lower commodity prices, it's definitely like Kathy would actually outperform today. Yeah. <laughs> when does that happen? So it's basically <laughs> all the battered up, you know, all the, all the garbage had, a, you know, like I'm just looking at some of the, the rises today at Coinbase, 13%. Um, a firm was up 14%, Roblox up 14%. Um, yeah, we just had some big bounces across the board. Roku up uh, almost 10%, wow. so some big gains on a lot of these um, smashed up stocks. Uh, so we got so there. This is actually um, crude oil. Um, oh, and nice. it's steadily yeah. been uptrending, and now it's been in a in a trading range. But as you can see, again, like um, the fundamental has got it up there, but now it's just consolidating within there, and there's opportunities to be making money on both sides of the market. Um, no, we can tell is a, like a, a range from um, touching. So if it goes to the top, comes back to the bottom, it's a top. And now that it's at the bottom, we know we're in a trade, in a trading range because it's just consolidating between these two um, key levels. And so right now, um, oil is, did drop a lot today. And um, I know that, was, that looks good, but we're still in the range and it could go back up again. 
ideally the best scenario for it to really go down is to break break this key level um probably we test it just to get some fine orders in and um steadily head lower if that's a potential option yeah uh, again we don't know yeah, I mean, how the yeah. fundamentals are going to play out so it could just as much easily stay down here and go back to the top and it really depends on um this again is another fundamental one that does impact what happens um, on a longer term yeah, but regardless of all the fundamentals that's happening then because that first big yeah. green bar was basically the start war, of the exactly. war right and then and, and since then despite everything that's going on it's actually just sort of played the range yeah. um you can see yeah but i think you know like if it took Talking about this fundamentally, I mean, I mean, this is my theory. Tell me what you guys think. But you know, initially, you know, we had oil rising on on the whole lack of supply. Um, you know, the markets are very tight, especially with the absence of Russian oil. Um, and so, Europe trying to now find new sources of oil. They're still exporting from Russia, but obviously they've cut it down. Especially also the natural gas as well. But the thing is, I saw this. Um, I, I need to go find it. Maybe I'll find it um, a bit later on. But um, how India from exporting no Russian oil, uh, importing no Russian oil, now import a, a real good chunk. China have increased their um, imports and said so Russia has now replaced their oil exports with two new markets, which is more of China and much more of India. So the thing is that that oil is now not lost on the market. It's just been redistributed. So the whole thing is that Russian oil is still servicing the market. So it's not been lost and that that production has not been lost. So in a way, that whole production fear is now sort of a bit more muted because it's not like the world is not getting Russian oil. The, the world is actually getting more yeah. Russian oil than it was prior yep. to the war. In fact, the, Russia is exporting more than they were prior to February. Yeah. So maybe this is why partly we've seen a bit of a, a cool down in oil prices because that supply glut is not, it, it's basically sort of freeing up a bit as Russia is now servicing other parts no, I think, of the I think world, you're, which I think you're completely mistaken. Biden told the oil companies, you must reduce your prices. <laughs> That's what it, is. it was all Biden. Look, Biden, Biden, told him. Biden did that. It's like, no, of course it's Biden. No, no, Biden's, it's Biden's, Biden's fault. It all went up. No, no. The thing is, everyone says it's Biden, Biden's fault, Biden's gas. If it, if it was Biden's fault on the way up, it's got to be Biden's gain on the way down. You have to be fair. But that's if, if the, if the prices go the way down up. by these corporations. Like I read about the India and China exporting from um, Russia, which makes sense because they don't care about what's going on in the world politics. They have their own people to service. And same with Sri Lanka, as you heard there on their last bit of oil too. So they have to yeah, yeah, fix up quick. And Russian oil is the only Sri way. Sri Lanka is in the they biggest. Are. They're literally a day yeah. away from bankruptcy. So um, Look, they need it's... to export from somewhere. And Russia will be the best place to do it. It's a conspiracy. But, you know, in terms of a global market, people will na naturally gravitate to where they can get the supply and a supplier at a good price. So what is stopping or flowing into India, China, and then being de redistributed from there to, to other nation states? Um, you know, obviously not the big uh, European ones, but um, you know, th that oil is flowing to other places where it's demanded. Um, and, you know, these politicians are trying to be self-righteous saying, Hey, we don't need Russia, Russian oil or, uh, you know, all, all the stuff that they produce, but they're integral part of an integral world economy. And, you know, you can't just shut that off just for reasons of ideology. No, like I said to you last time, Russia, Russia make up 12% of the landmass in the, in the whole world. They're in fact, almost double the size of the next biggest landmass, which is Canada. And most of Canada is uninhabitable. So the thing <laughs> is, is it's, it just shows you can't cut that out. But I've got, I've got this tweet up here, India pre the war was importing 30,000 barrels per day of Russian oil, and now they're importing a million wow, barrels. that's massive. So there mm -hmm. you go. And pre-war, China were um, uh, importing around 1.7 million barrels, and now it's 2 million. So there you go. So it is a massive increase, especially from India on Russian crude. And um, yep, that's Biden doing his work, <laughs> and he's brought down fuel prices. And let's just see. Like, the thing is, it was $5 a barrel, uh, $5 a gallon. Um, you know, the thing about all of this is we've seen oil come down. The question is, how quickly does it come down on a pump? Because the petrol station, the, the gas station is your live counter for inflation. The, that Forget about all the other prices. That is your daily thing as you drive. That's like your your um, yeah. gauge that tells you what inflation is. So it was um, four, five bucks, like literally a week and a half. Yesterday, I filled up at 458. And I think after today's move, if it can consolidate below 100, we're going to go back below four bucks again. And I think if there's a free handle, if we get to 395, 390, just psychologically, it will actually improve consumer okay. confidence. Okay. Um, I think the whole, just the way the world, you know, especially in America, the way people are just talking about gas prices, just to see that three handle again, they'll just go, this is amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think um, we'll definitely lift a lot of pressure off um, Biden um, doing that amazing um, 
maneuvering. But my my theory is this: we've had, you know, he's tr- Biden trying to go to Saudi Arabia, got rejected. He tried to he's doing these useless tweets that he's oil companies and gas companies. I mean, you know, just Stop totally it. pointless. But you know what it is? The Fed is doing QE, sixty billion a month, eighty billion a month. Use that. The government is big enough to just short the living daylights out of crude. You think this ten percent move might have been the government? Biden just saying, let's get ten billion out of your Fed rather than buying back bonds. Uh, can you uh, sell the shit out of crude? And you know, with ten billion, you can easily just dump this market. That's the easiest way. Why try diplomacy? Just get in the market and then sell the crap out yeah. of it. You know, why yeah, wouldn't you do that? Definitely. I mean, at the end of the day, Rajan, why don't you use your <laughs> You know, just your 100 million that you've got, and just you know, trying to nudge the market a couple of percent a day if Penny. you can. Why yeah. not? If you can, because because 100 million Zimbabwean <laughs> dollars is not worth much nowadays. <laughs> so, you know, it's like yeah, you know, the 100 million. I think it might be worth five bucks. You know, so it's like that you can buy a McDonald's. To have, you know, so this is Fairly. the problem. Yeah, this not is the inflation. It. I can buy a, yeah. I can buy a, I can buy a chicken sandwich meal for 100 million. Well, that was another indication of inflation. Right. Their burgers have gone up big time. No, but you you know about the the McDonald's inflation yeah, yeah. track. Was it the the, the the McRib? Yeah, we've said yeah. this. You know, it's widely been documented. <laughs> but look, at the end of the day, like you're saying, Rajan, <laughs> we need to get these fuel prices down as much as possible. They affect pretty much every product you buy. You know, has transportation costs. Bring that down. You know, you're going to see a uh, a happy public um, and. Biden getting a bit of respite from all the crap he's getting. But yeah, this is it. Um, obviously, a lot more going on in the world. I mean, what's the next chart you've got for us? So, I mean, we did have Tesla numbers um, over this weekend. Um, uh, you know, they, they had, obviously, just like a lot of um, with the China lockdowns, they did get um, heavily impacted. But they just come out with numbers which came in line with expectations. Um, but today, you know, the, 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 the movement was a bit muted, but it does look like they're in a range yeah, um, looking at that chart. I think there's like... Um... Hmm. Two levels to look out for from a quick analysis of the weekly. Um, as you can see, um, post COVID just jumped up. Um, been hitting this kind of high around um, 1,150. It can't seem to break it properly or close above it nicely. So um, it's dipping down, but it's still in a massive option. If you think about it long term, like there's nothing wrong with it. But the two levels I'll be looking at is this level where there was a double bottom and a massive push up, and again this consolidation before the first rise. So a lot of people entered on this first one where it pumped up. And again, here, a lot of people didn't want it to fall below this price range. I think, um, Jason, I was talking to you, remember, I said it will get into within this price range um, around these weeks. Mm-hmm. As it will come yeah. back down, and it did. Mm-hmm. It did, um, yeah, you're the, right the, there. These are two potential um, buying places where you can maybe short your way down uh, and then buy at these levels. But right now, again, we're in a consolidation. So we see which way it reacts to the upside or downside. Um, they are making lower lows now, but again, we're still in uptrend until it breaks this one, this low. Um, I'll still consider an uptrend. And yeah, well, this will first, be the final. This will yeah, be the I mean, final show before. Then it's bad. <laughs> so with that <laughs> first results. massive uptrend you were talking about, obviously that was the S and P 500 this inclusion, one, yeah. oh, this and obviously you know yeah. caused uh, you know the index to kind of rebalance by a crap load of shares. Obviously a fantastic time for mm-hmm. us test uh, shareholders. Obviously, you know, uh, have seen wild swings up and down since then. Um, you know, arguably, it, when it hit its highs in November 2021, around like, was it 1,235 or something like that, whatever the high was, obviously very overbought at that time. So we expected some kind of retracement, but obviously macro is weighed down hard on a terrific growth story, which is Tesla. In my opinion, obviously, I've said it out quite a few times, but it's, yeah, I mean- it's obviously going to be the largest company by market cap in the world. Um, but right now, I see it as obviously a great buying opportunity. It's a gift from the gods, but obviously it depends. How, do you have dry powder? That's the thing. Imagine what do you reckon? So that's what it is. It's always about the bullets. But the thing is, you know, I'm looking at Tesla and, and it has really been stagging, but it's it's been clumped, maybe not to the same extent as some of these other ones, but it, we've talked about this before. Um, we talked about this huge drop in crypto, Bitcoin, really can't get it, can't consolidate, can't stay above 20,000. Again, it was about 19,000, went back below 19,000 over this weekend. And I think with the market rally, we had Bitcoin rallying a bit back towards that 20,000. But you've got Tesla, which holds about, you know, what, over a billion of Bitcoin. You've got Square that hold Bitcoin. You have PayPal, I believe as well. So a lot of these companies that hold Bitcoin on their balance sheets are, get, is, are getting punished. And obviously <clears> Tesla <throat> is a much bigger company. So that yeah. amount is a smaller portion, but they're still going to have to take. Um, yeah, it's going to be around $445 million in... dollar right down on BTC 
also in this uh, wow. upcoming earnings, you can see an impairment charge and a 180 million dollar uh, severance. So it's like about 45 cents a share total. So yeah, that, that's always going to hit earnings uh, for Tesla. Obviously, we'll get that in the next uh, two weeks or so. But yeah, we, it's, we're going to see not a great earnings, but you know, to, no, be, to honest, be honest, you, you have you, to compare to honest, it I think with Tesla. the competition. Like who else? You know, I think that their their margins are going to go down from the almost day to probably around. 22 to 23 percent range obviously because of the shutdowns and all, all of the other battles they've been facing um or on production but you know you just look at any other company trying to make evs and it's just like absolute chalk and cheese yeah i mean you know you know it's funny you say that because i mean ford came out today they actually had a 31 percent rise in year on year sales so they actually had a really good number there was one thing that they wrote in their pr which i was like oh my god this is just so what their EV production was um, for the month of June about four and a half thousand. That includes some F one fifty Lightning, some Mackies, and some E Transits. And they go, we produce the second highest amount to Tesla. And I was just like, wow, the second highest amount is four and a half thousand. That's just that's just that is that is bad. But although that is just US production, so obviously Tesla's numbers is worldwide. So um, you know, like just average it out, they're two hundred sixty thousand. Uh, let's call it about. 85,000 a month, but I don't know how much of that is US, but still, let's just say 40,000 is US, uh, 45,000 is US is still nine times more than the next highest. I mean, you know, you know, so uh, it's, um, Berlin, obviously quite low in terms of their output. Well, actually Shanghai was amazing. June had the highest ever production um, for, for Tesla. And if you annualize that production rate uh, that they had in June, obviously you can't, but uh, you would get about 1.8 million units annualized for the year if they kept up June's production. Um, so that is insane. Yeah, so this is Ford. Um, as you can see, it's not looking great, but there's still money to be made on the short side. So um, we had this huge spike up, some consolidation, and a final what we call exhaustion bar, which means like everybody just milking the market. And you can see it came straight back down. And so when you see three bars like this, it's normally the sign of a, a reversal and a good time to short. So there was great opportunities to short all the way down. And... Um, Again, we look for key zones where there may be some demand that can change the direction of the market. But um, as you can see, Ford has just been blowing past all of these like, key levels and has not been holding. So um, right now, we're at the, what I would say is like one of the final key areas of this whole big movement. Let me zoom out a bit more. Yeah, so this is the start of um, this is the start of the uptrend. As you can see, prior to that, we're going in downtrend. And then once we break above that, come back down and start going up, we're in an uptrend. And as you can see, then it's just been a sharp sell-off. So if this area doesn't hold, what are we looking for? If this area doesn't hold, if I was trading for that was, I'll be waiting um, for a breakout just um, above this high, just to show that there is some momentum. Because again, as I said, when people do get into the market, they put their, their stops above the swing highs and swing lows. So if they can get above this, it shows that they're trying to push in a different direction and there's money going in that direction. But if it doesn't hold this level, I'll look to continue to short. There's um there's still quite a lot of space on the downside. And if they can't compete and their earnings show that they're not doing that great with the EV and gas prices being so high, um, it may continue to fall short. Yeah, I mean, again, it's uh, it, Ford is one of the victims of you know the EV mm -hmm. bubble. Exactly. And that whole move yeah. up was just yeah. the whole EV hype. And you look at a lot of these EV names, I mean, you know, Ford came with a lot of promise about, you know, and, and they, they're great models like the Mackie. Everything they've come out with great, but the, the one thing is they just can't produce enough, and that's why it's come back down. I mean, I think the whole promise that they can really take on Tesla, but with the production levels that they're doing right now, it's exactly. just uh, it's a bit laughable, you know. I mean, I've been waiting at my Mackie orders now, been uh, eight nine months. I, to be honest, I don't even know if I'm going to get it this year. To be honest, I'm going to have to look elsewhere, um, sadly, because it's, it, you know, it just seems crazy. And there's just been no communication in terms of anything about when it, when it even might come. That's close a problem. To getting Supply it chain has so, been um, um, battered. Yeah. But it's not only it's that, just, um, though. Impossible to get anything. The... I think the supply chain partly, yeah, but, yeah, but it's the cost supply chain as well. Been, well you know, like I... unemployment and all that, and just yeah. people changing their view on how work should be. That's just changed yeah. a lot. But in too. terms of with Ford, I mean, obviously, yeah. they've had a, I guess, uh, devastating uh, EVPR, my nightmare with, you know, uh, a 50,000 EV 
Uh, I think pretty much all the Mackies they've made, you know, have been recalled over worries that uh, battery overheating oh, wow. might cause the cars and trucks to uh, lose power. This is the main thing where Tesla have a massive advantage. There's this um, Forbes article just kind of running through it all. And it was saying how Tesla, if they have uh, a problem with the battery uh, overheating, they'll just send a software update straight away uh, to the BMS, the battery management system, um, to regulate that. And, uh, well, to be honest, people wouldn't even know that there was an issue. It would be dealt with before it you know, it, it even hits the recall stage. But with Ford, obviously, they've got their legacy thinking and that's obviously going to a dealership. So it's going to cost them cost them a lot of money. Nice. Same, same story with uh, General Motors. And it, it's a bit, bit of a shame because I thought that Ford, you know, they're not going to be like GM. You know, they, like with, just imagine uh, Biden was saying that Mary Barra and GM are leading the industry when they sold like 26 EVs the whole quarter. They've completely smashed the uh, GM Bolt a reputation. But it was a good car. I'll, I'll be honest with you, but you know, this Bolt, I, I do want to say, I've been seeing the new ones that they have, the, the EUV and that, and, and they're very, actually very compelling. And you know, all these the Bolts, the, all their batteries have been changed. And if if, if you're actually looking for an, a, a deal, like you can probably get, I haven't actually looked, but I've um, been watching a couple of these videos and seeing that you can get some phenomenal deals on some of the older Bolts and you don't have to worry about because all those batteries have been changed. And so if you want an EV and, um, you get past the stigma of what a bolt was, you can get a great deal on a on a on one of the old bolts right now. So I, I'm just intrigued to see how much they're going for because the, the batteries have been changed, yeah. like that problem has been rectified. And maybe while these EV prices have gone through the roofs, 50, 60, 70 yeah, grand. You, I think the thing about the bolt is the same thing as the leaf. That, you know, it's just a small um, little cut. I know, but like, but the but Tesla know, but has the feel, the status. Yeah, like, but, if you're going to spend it roughly that much, but Tesla it's, is it's still, three and a half um, times the price. For what it is, it's That's still a reasonable it's, it's price. A totally yeah, I guess I thought, so if you're looking for a cheaper one, this is a good option, alternative. But If you just want to run around EV and, you know, for like, it could be one of the how, best How does it compare to the Nissan Leaf? I think it's actually a good... I mean, they're yeah, supposed to have like more range than the Leaf. I think the Leaf obviously looks slightly better. But in a way, you can kind of just see like GM's reluctance to you know want to go ev because oh mm -hmm. we've all the problems that we're having with our evs like dealerships just carry on peddling our um you know gas powered cars and you know things will be okay and we're just the hybrids and the plug-in hybrids they're fine because I, I i see that's the, you know what toyota and uh these other companies that can't actually make enough evs you know they're really trying to push uh the lobbyists to um kind of accept uh plug-in hybrids as an alternative but either way you know what the thing is what we can see the consumers spoken they want evs it doesn't have to have a super long range but it just needs to have a decent charging infrastructure these like a decent car uh like you know the, the, obviously if you look at gm's uh best-selling cars even nissan's like the kashkai and the nissan rogue or whatever it is in the in the us they call it extra here those type of cars just you know it, it should be relatively easy when you when you think about it just to whack some batteries in there and they'll sell like uh, hotcakes but unfortunately they're now coming to see that making EVs is actually really, really hard. And the hardest part about it is that supply chain. Can they keep it up? You know, and the, and we were always been told by the mainstream media the competition's coming. Obviously, we, me and Rajan have talking about uh, spoken about this till death. But the thing is, looking at battery mineral supply contracts, I still can't see any of the legacy automakers having like huge supply contracts for all the minerals that are required to uh, and metals required to actually create the the batteries and because they don't they kind of just they're just in this limbo state so it was stating these uh these goals that they have but without anything to back it up it's not like the internal combustion engine so yeah we'll see what happens i don't think toyota and like um, nissan had dropped the ball toyota's had the prius for how long and they've never advanced it or yeah. just sat on it to be honest even when the ev change is coming They've done nothing. So, I mean, the, the, the BZ, um, what's it called? The BZ4X or their new it's too one. Late now. I mean, they're, they're they're had, the, they've had the Prius since day one. Everyone used Prius as a status one. symbol yeah. of being a hippie, being eco friendly. And they could have they could have driven yeah. that the moment Tesla or Nissan Leaf came out. They've done nothing with it. That's what really, really makes me upset. Because just imagine, like, you know, if you look at the Prius, it, it just the just a regular one, not the plug in one, right? It's like it, it didn't get any better in terms of like the range you could run on the battery, you know. It's like yeah. literally, it, looked it the same with... yeah. Yeah. It, one, one model, it looked the same, the, it acted the same, the and it had, it had the status symbol that Tesla has now, like oh, you're eco friendly. Like it, they had it, they had the image, they had the branding, and it did nothing with it. And they're a massive company, they could have easily invested in it, got in there early. Like they know what's coming in the future, and they just don't want to react, and that's the problem with corporations, they get too heavy.
No, what they had before was one of the All most right, popular vehicles this, yeah. in the US, which was the Toyota RAV4, right? They had the EV version, mm -hmm. which they were making, obviously, to satisfy the Californian zero emission mandate, right? So they had it, and they used to actually use Tesla components in there. So Tesla supplied the motors and the uh, EV mm -hmm. drivetrain, the um, uh, batteries as well. But, you know, they sold their stake in Tesla, ditched the whole program, and only in 2022 are they, you know, making evs again but they've all been recorded because the wheels fall off <laughs> so this is the craziest thing like how is this possible every be every big I mean, automaker has problems I mean, with just... their evs isn't that just crazy that's like you know that's like but that's basically like mcdonald's that's like mcdonald's coming yeah, out exactly with like, and then it's, it's, it makes no sense like, 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 like where's the testing like, i'm sure they do hours and hours and like hundreds of thousands of kilometers of testing like where is this yeah. It makes sense. Anyway, anyway, that's what I'm trying to say. Like, it, it, sometimes it's the yeah. Let's move on. Anyway, let, let's move. Let's move on from this. Right, come, so show us the last couple of charts you got. Um, I understand you've got a couple more sure. charts. Um, um, some of the big so, names. I, I mean, what are you looking at? It's just funny to look at the Nasdaq. Like I was saying, like um, just the overall trend of the market, how it's been for years, right? So, so this is the COVID drop right here, our market. This will happen with COVID, and everyone was scared, and this is like the worst thing ever. And then just the rally after has been insane. Um, it's like. The amount of money that was pumped into the market is just unbelievable. And so now, like everyone's crying about, like, oh, we're, we're dying. We're, like, it's just more of a correction. Um, it's coming down to these levels. Like, um, it hasn't even exactly. touched where we were before COVID. Like, um, again, for in the in the past two years, look how much the movement has been compared to the last ten years. It's compared to the last ten years of movement in the Nasdaq for the past two years. It's just um. I mean, it's funny that you show that because that's why I think like we saw Tesla sort of console. I, I think now the, there's a lot of expectation that oh, yeah, it's exactly. 50% gain, 100% gain again quickly. But, you know, before, you know, you used to go, oh, mm -hmm. in three years, I got a 20% return. You know, it's but not, now yeah. like 20%, exactly. oh, yeah, you get that in one day. But you can sort of see that if it sort of gets back to a more normal trajectory, that these big one day or one year gains might and, be. And that's what people past, expect. At least near term. People expect, and, they, they uh, want that, like they expect it, them to get yeah. in the bottom and ride it like 50% at the top. In a couple of days, they just the expectations are unrealistic. Even with the housing market, it's just unrealistic amount. Like everything has gone, um, and if they don't get them gains, they don't want to be in it, and that's the problem. Um, so that's that one. Let me check. Um, what was I doing? We done oil, right? Yeah, oil. Um, I did Tesla. Netflix is one of those things that just shows that sometimes technical analysis isn't always the key fundamentals do play a part. There's a massive level here, and obviously Netflix has lost subscribers. It's no, it's no longer a growth company. Um, and it just tanked, and you can see. So this is where the technical wouldn't come to use, and fundamentals do play a place. But again, I don't worry about these these things. I kind of more example on the Nasdaq today. I remember I took a trade. So so an hourly, one second. An hourly was hitting um, these bottoms, and it didn't want to break below. So I went to a smaller time frame, and from the open, I noticed um, it just didn't want to break below. So I had a key level here. And it broke apart with this really these two bullish candles and instantly dropped back halfway. So I knew um, there's going to be people just getting out of the position thinking that it would go lower. And so I took a, a buy above um, the bar because if it breaks above that bar, it shows that the buyers are stronger than the sellers and um, they want to take part and get back to the high and close the gap. Um, so they got up there and I closed that position, but it came back down. And I know it's further consolidation and not wanting to break that key level. So I got back in again above um, this area and rolled it there. And I closed that pretty early because oil was acting up and I didn't know how far this would ride up, but there was a lot of momentum to the upside. That's how I normally trade. I don't care about the fundamentals and stuff like that because I could short it either way. I could buy it. And so whatever the, the technicals are telling me and how the day opens up and the morning goes is how I'd make my decisions on the day. Yeah, I mean, yeah, like on the fundamental yeah. side, which you see the Nasdaq outperform, as like growth was outperforming because of lower rates, lower oil and that's why the S and P and Dow was actually down because of you know being weighed down by these energy names and things like that. But um, yeah, it's interesting um, to see the, the Nasdaq like that. I mean, even um, it's again, I think we're going to be seeing a lot of chop, you know, back and forth. Um, you know, where we are right now, I don't really think we're going to yeah. really see a clear trend anytime soon. But um, there's going to be a lot of opportunity to just like, exactly. <clears throat> That's play exactly the what ranges is. in this market yeah, right now. That's, especially that's, with my, the that's what I think, you know. QT they're going to be doing. It's, it's just kind of like a massive 
I don't know, spanner in the works for anyone who thinks that, okay, we're going to go back to all time highs uh, and all these yeah, stocks. Exactly. But I, I do yeah. predict that we're going to have quite a few days like we've had today in terms of, you know, like a 13% gain in Coinbase, et cetera, you know, those type of big ones. So um, the attitude for certain, you know, very short term traders, you know, will still be seeking those type of opportunities and, you know, they're going to get them, um, especially now. It, it all depends on what the overall trend of the market is going to be. Obviously, a lot of money was taken off the table, whether that's going to re-enter, when it's going to re-enter, if it's going to re-enter. Um, that's the big question. You know, you're getting 1.7, 2%, 2.5% savings accounts. And, you know, if you can get guaranteed 2, 3% or go through the wild volatility I mean, that's why some people, they can just sleep better at night getting their 3%. You know? So, you know, I'm a degenerate gambler at heart. So, you know, that, that's never going to be me. But, you know, it is sometimes it is. A, I, nice I remember I opened, um, be, I downloaded but... that crypto app and I put some money in. And then um, it's like, it showed me the public coins and one's up like 5,000% and one's down 6,000%. I'm like, it's like a high stakes casino. What is it? It's not in the bank. It's like, um, these are the gains people expect these days. And so I think now that the market stopped giving those gains and it's ranging, they're kind of pulling their money out of it. And trying to find alternate places. So this is it. This, this exactly, is TikTok yeah. financial advisors now sort of dissipated, ones, like, right? Well, like all of these Instagram, exactly. uh, Lamborghini, uh, Lamborghini they, they like, players. Yeah, you the, know. Moment you, the moment you put like yeah, ten bucks into Bitcoin two years ago and you made fifty bucks, you're, you're instantly a, a Bitcoin trader. That's how it works these days. Like, I'll put it on your profile. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, which are fifty bucks you went with yeah, the fifty exactly. bucks you managed to find exactly, exactly. Take a picture like, outside it, someone Social media is also smoke and mirrors. That's what it is. At the day, um, I wouldn't take any of that to heart. And you got to understand that people, um. Half the time on the internet, when you see articles about stocks that are, have been idle and ready to pump pump up, like these are people that have lost money in these and they just wanted to go up. So they're using you to buy more of it so they can exit the market at profit or break even. So really, you're just the, the pump and dump person in that scenario. And so it happened a lot on Discord. Yeah. Talk, I don't know if you talked about it before, but Discord groups are the biggest pump and dumps. They just, and yeah. Telegram groups as well. Oh, yeah. yeah, Discord Telegram is too, yeah. the new boiler room. It's that, yeah, <laughs> Telegram and Discram, uh, uh, Discord. Yeah is the yeah, real yeah. life boiler room like you watch that boiler room the movie with vin diesel right so i mean you know you ain't you ain't got it's the song, so much that. more it's like amazing. untraceable it's, just, um, it's like it's just number one thing you know you is. can just set a whole bunch of bots up to you know yeah. and uh, they do. kind of manipulate that i, yeah, I get exactly. it every day these messages yeah. from these um about in the this crypto is going to expand like 300 percent in two weeks like um yeah there's so many scams but, out there just uh, he's got to do your own research yeah no, i mean yeah. you know what it is it's so compelling you know what you know the thing is if you just want to just exit this rat race, you just want to make it successful. You see, you know, you see in your, you know, just everywhere on your feed, like these riches and everything everywhere. And, and you, and some guy goes, look at our mm -hmm. history. We've made exactly. 100% this month. Yeah. Like, but look, even our like, dad, give it to me even, even our dad stuff. got it's, into um, one, uh, Veta dot AI. Yeah, I think he got, he got in that, like, uh, yeah. he, he put in one and a half thousand. It went up to like, oh, I think 44, yeah. 45,000. And nice. he could have taken gains then, but he waited for it to all drop out and he kind of just scratched. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, the thing. that's the thing too. With trading, like, um, if you can hit 45, like everybody, um, what's that, that shit, that meme coin, Dogecoin, right? Everybody, the, the whole state was like, um, it's going to hit a dollar, it's going to hit a dollar. And then it got to like 90, 80, 90 cents and then just never went back up. Yeah. But see, this is this is how these people have been wired. Like, you know, in this better AI, even in, you know, when you're like, if it was me, one and a half. At least take, at least take your, mind, your money out of the market. Three, three right. X, I'm out. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. But, mm. but these new new gens have been programmed in such a way that a one and a half. But the other thing too is money. Um, not enough. The young people are doing have access enough. that we didn't have back in the day to these. Um, like we had to get permission <laughs> to get to send the money. I took weeks before it happened. Now you can send the money so quickly. They don't have the same financial responsibility. They don't care if they put hundred grand in something and whatever happens, they'll make it back. Whereas we have mortgages and um, bills and stuff like that where it does matter. So it's a different kind of a mentality towards it too. But it seems like big money was obviously all behind it as well because for Technical all of these, here, got the real um, you know, yeah. crypto coins and uh, as well as mm. well as all, as all these unprofitable tech companies were just getting pumped to the moon. And it wasn't just retail doing that. It's obviously big money behind it too. And obviously they were the first in November 2021. They just like, okay, we're starting to sell. And obviously yeah. Chamatha, we keep on going back to it. Uh, yeah. so, but they, they know, knew, all these insiders were yeah, getting you know, out. They, all the insiders, yeah. but they knew that the insiders were getting out on these like yeah. crappy stocks that would go nowhere. So they took everyone's money, and they essentially their job is to not have you invest on your own. They want you to invest in them to invest their money, so they make a profit. So once they shake everyone out the market, they're like, "All right, good. Now these guys can come back to us, but, and we can take our cut." And that was the goal, and they, they did it. Yeah, exactly. The, the writing was on the wall. The writing was on the wall. Like we saw, I remember, you know, we had Shamath um, saying what he said, but also if you looked at the number of insider sales, Jeez. it was like all these CEOs yeah. everywhere, uh, CFOs, um, uh, management, 
were selling like there was no tomorrow. But now, yeah, Elon Musk, Elon Musk has made some of the best trade. He sold about fifteen billion dollars of well, Tesla the best one, the best above the ground. Um, Nancy Pelosi, you know, and he could just buy it all back. And yeah, <laughs> he's, he's, the best, he's the best trader. Yeah, 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 the Pelosi tracker. But to be honest, yeah, to be honest, he's the best trader. The question is, did he get out? Oh, no, he knows when to he get out. He might have been long all of these shares because right now his portfolio ain't doing that good. That's it. But anyway, thanks for coming yeah. to the pod. It was a great conversation, um, nice and insightful. Um, yep. Uh, please like and subscribe if you liked what you heard. Sit <laughs> from Mitt, the star, you know. Yeah, He's got the, the real Ferrari, Ferrari, not the fake one, one, you know. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot. Guys. Yeah, for, yeah, it's been a pleasure. And yeah. uh, we'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace. Yep, see ya.